I was thinking about Block Party, and they have a decorating day the Saturday before, and that is true this year too, and you can definitely come and help out with that. And, and you'll see one of the reasons why. So we, it was a few years ago, they had this decorating event. The theme was Nintendo. Okay, the theme was Nintendo, which is one of my favorites because I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a Nintendo guy. Okay, and so and I'm, it's probably about 1 o'clock in the afternoon at this point. And as it's 1 o'clock, I'm, I'm thinking it's Saturday. Like I kind of like to go home and maybe take a nap because I've been working hard all day. And I work kind of hard on Sundays. And so I was like, it would be nice if I, could, if I could go home and take a nap. So I go up to Pastor Ashley, regrettably, and I say, hey, um, I'm getting ready to go home. Looks like everything's together here on the inside of the building. Is there anything else you would like me to do before I go home? Yeah. And so I, I'm like, is there anything, anything that you've got? And she's like, well, yeah, if, since you asked, um, there are some tires behind the Chinese church. And if you don't mind, before you go home, could you move those tires from behind the Chinese church out to the front of our patio because it's like a little Mario Kart track. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I can do that before I go home. And I go to the back of the Chinese church, and there's a hundred tires back there. Like, I'm not kidding, there's a hundred, okay? And so I'm like, okay. Um, clearly, she didn't think this job was very big. So, and the, I'm the only one that was asked to do it. And, and so I start picking up tires that are also full of water. And, and, and I'm like, moving them. And after about, I don't know, about 30 minutes, I have moved four tires over to the front of the patio, and I'm realizing that that nap isn't going to happen. And so I, I'm like, oh. And so like, then I'm like, okay, I can't. This isn't going to work. Like, me moving a hundred, like, this isn't going to happen. And so I, I'm like, I'm just scanning the parking lot, praying that there's a truck, okay? And I see a truck, and I, I'm like, okay, someone brought a truck, okay? I'm going to use that old golden charm. So I, I go up, and I'm like, hey, uh, I borrow your truck? I'm going to move 100 tires. And, and they were like, yeah, it's like, nice to meet you. I'm Ryan. Like, so that happened. And then, um, about two hours later, we had this thing created. You can see it. that there is. We didn't use all the tires, but we did use most. There's, it might not look like much. There are 60 tires there, okay? And, and all I can remember, this is all I remember, that the visual that's in my mind is myself and Josh Laird soaking wet with tire water. And it was like, and, and honestly, the, the real irony is that two hours earlier, I thought I was going home, and I wasn't. And sometimes it happens, right? You commit to something, you know that it's going to be challenging, but you have no idea how challenging it is, and it's kind of revealed through the process. And, and as I was just thinking about, like, even like maybe you're here and you decided to go back to school, you knew it was going to be hard. But man, you really feel it when it's 11 o'clock at night, you want to go to sleep, but you're writing a paper. Or you said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going I'm to commit to get back into shape. And so you commit to get back into shape. And then you, you, you do it, and you knew it was going to be hard, but then that time where you, you really would rather just be sitting at home watching TV, but you have to go to the gym instead, that's when you really feel it. And what happened last week is Pastor Ryan Zafiroff preached on, on Jesus, and, and he was in the garden. And he was in the garden praying with his disciples, and, and as he's praying, what happens is the religious establishment of the day, they capture him. And when they capture him, they, they begin him on the road that will inevitably lead him to the cross. And what we see here is that, that really what Jesus was doing was he was committing to the cross. That he was in control the whole time, that none of this caught him off guard, and we'll see that in a minute, but really what he was doing was he was committing to his fate in that moment when he let them capture him. And what we'll see in really the weeks to come is we'll see that that commitment to the cross was far more challenging than him just going to the cross. And we see that especially true in our text this morning. It's in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 14, and we'll pick it up in verse 53. And it says this, <clears throat> and they led Jesus to the high priest. This is when they captured him in the garden. They led him to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. And now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony to put Jesus to death. Like what Mark is wanting us to see here is a, he wants us to see this picture. And, and it's a picture of Jesus 
on an island by himself. That, that not only is it a picture of Jesus on an island by himself, but he is completely opposed. That last week, it, the prophecy that Zechariah gave, not that it matters who did it, but it, it was fulfilled. That Jesus was captured in the garden, they struck at the shepherd, and the sheep scattered. He's by himself. That the people who are closest to him in this world are nowhere to be found when Jesus needs them the most. Then what happens after this is the one who seems kind of close is Peter. And what Peter does in the, in the, the verses following this text that we're going to look at this morning is Peter denies Jesus three times. And so what you have is Jesus. You have Jesus completely by himself standing opposed to the religious establishment of the day with no friend at all. And, and you, you see that in the phrase where Mark says that the whole council was present. Now, most commentators, they believe that when it says whole council there, it's talking about the Jewish Sanhedrin. And the Jewish Sanhedrin would be the, the governing body of, of the, the Jewish people of that day. And it, it was comprised of 71 priests and scribes and teachers and one high priest. And so the picture here is Je- like Jesus standing trial with 72 people against him and him standing all by himself. Now, we know there were some sympathizers inside of the Sanhedrin. We know that from other Gospels. But what Mark wants us to see is he wants us to see that Jesus, in his road to the cross, that he's all by himself. And as he's all by himself, he's standing against this group of people who are convinced that Jesus Christ stands opposed to the God of Israel. And what they want is they want to kill him. But something that they do is is really one of the themes that you see Mark bring out is that they want to do so in a way that it at least appears to be legitimate. And and really, you you kind of see how that works as the text goes forward. Look at this. It says this. It says, And the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. So what were they doing? Well, you see that in the verses that follow, in verse 56, it says, For many bore false witness against Jesus, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build yet another not made with hands. But even about this, their testimony did not agree. This is, you see here in these verses that there is this appearance of this wanting to, to appear legit or legal. Now, in the United States of America, we have this idea that, that you are innocent until proven guilty. It's one of like, the rights of being a United States citizen. Well, you see from the very beginning that that's not what, that's not what they're doing with Jesus. They've actually already determined that he's guilty and that he deserves to die. I mean, it says they, 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 were, they wanted to put it, they, they, he is guilty and he deserves to die, and now we're going to figure out how we can do that. And, and it's really interesting because, they, they, I mean, obviously that doesn't seem very just. Obviously it doesn't seem legitimate. Obviously that's not, not the way that you should approach that type of thing. And even though that is the case, okay, they're still like, okay, we're, we've already determined what's going to happen, but... We want to do it in a way that doesn't break our law. That in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that if you would put someone to death, that the way you do that is by the testimony of of two or three witnesses. And so that's what they're trying to do. Is they're saying, okay, we need to get two people, two or three people, that can completely agree on this accusation made against Jesus. And as soon as we get that, then we can... We can, we can kill him. And it's, it's, it's fascinating because what is happening, because in, in, in a Jewish court, what would happen is the people who were the witnesses would also serve as the prosecution. And, and what is they're giving like the big picture of what Jesus has done that they think, I don't know, where he deserves to die, they're not agreeing on some of the finer points of the story. But what Schnabel says in his commentary is he says that that it's, it's really likely that what they're disagreeing on, and because it, 
they mention the temple, the thing he says about the temple, which would have been grounds to, to kill him. But what they're disagreeing on is they're disagreeing about time, location, where Jesus said things. And because they can't agree on these finer details, if the text were to stop right here, they wouldn't be able to execute Jesus. Because for whatever reason, their testimony will not agree. And so the high priest is kind of seeing this. They kind of look like idiots. It almost feels like a kangaroo court, like that nothing is really working. And so then what happens next is the high priest steps in because he realizes that right now, if things continue going the way they are. They, they, they can't do what they set out to do. And so he steps in and says this. He says, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent and made no answer. He sees what's happening. The high priest realizes that if he doesn't step in, they're not going to be able to do what they want to do. And so he takes matters into his own hands. You know, like when your kids do something, like you want them to help, and then it just gets really worse <laughs> there comes a point where you just have to like step in and do it yourself. Like my kids always want to help me make coffee. And it's like, coffee isn't made, but there's a lot of sweeping that ends up happening at the end. And it's me that's doing the sweeping. It's like, so it comes a point where I just have to step in if I want to drink coffee. And, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like that. He's trying to get this proceeding to go the way that it's supposed to go. And as he's watching, he's like, this isn't going to work. So he's like, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And Jesus doesn't say a word. Now, there's a lot of reasons why he, people think that. One is that if you read the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, it talks about how, how the lamb is, is led into the, really the presence of his enemies to be killed, and they remain silent and doesn't say a word. So part of what's going on is Jesus isn't answering, he isn't responding, because he's fulfilling the prophecy that Isaiah made all those years ago. But, but even more than that, what, Jesus, what this shows us about Jesus, because when we'll see it from what comes next, is you see that Jesus has resolved that he's going to die. That he's committed fully to the fate that is before him. And because of that, he's, there's nothing to say. Because if he wasn't resolved, he probably could have said something. He's the smartest person that's ever lived. He could have said something to... Uh, to to get out of it, but he doesn't say anything because probably anything he would say would help his case because he was committed to the cross. And then as it goes forward, the high priest asks another question. And this is why I think that it, you see how resolved Jesus was and you see that with how he responds to this next question. Look at it. And the high priest asked him again, he said, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do you need? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving of death. When you think about everything that's going on in Mark's gospel, okay, and we've been talking about Mark's gospel for a minute now, one of the things, that, especially early on, that people would ask me when they would, you know, when we'd, we would teach on a text, is they'd be like, so why is Jesus, like, not, like, telling people who he is? Like, time and again, if you think about, and you could go through, you know, on your own and just read through Mark's gospel, and what you'll see is you'll see Jesus does a miracle, and what does he do? He commands people not to say he forgives someone his sins and he commands them not to tell what happened. That he, over and over again, he's like, don't say a word. But now here he is and he says everything. What happened? Like, did he go from being secretive to being an overshare overnight? Like, is that what happened? That no, what happened was that we see something that Mark is showing us really clearly and he's showing us that now is time. 
that the reason why Jesus wasn't revealing who he was early on in the story is because you didn't have a a full picture of who the Messiah was and what the Messiah came to do. But now, as as he's looking down the barrel of suffering, now he'll say that he is who he was because now we all have a full picture of what he came to do. He waited until the cross was in the, he was in the shadow of the cross so that no one mistaked him for only coming for the crown. And it's really interesting because there's only two times in, in Mark's gospel <clears throat> where Jesus says that this is who he is. It's this time and then a few chapters earlier in Mark chapter 8. And it's this conversation and it's basically like the, the disciples are like, hey Jesus, who are you? And, and Jesus is like, I'm not going to play your game. Who do you say that I am? And, and Peter's like, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, you're right, I am. And this is what Peter tells him to say. You see this in, in Mark chapter, chapter 8, verse 30. He says, and Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So here in chapter 8, it's like, don't say a word about who I am. But here in 14, I am who I am. And it's really amazing if you think about it. Because if Jesus lets them go and tell people who he is, well, what's going to happen is they're going to make him king. They're going to fight to make him king. Because he's the one they've been waiting for. But now, as he's telling them who he is, they're going to kill him for it. And it shows us something about Jesus that's incredibly beautiful that he's more concerned with what he can give than with what he can receive. That it was never about anything other than him giving, him giving his life, and that's why he was so careful until when it's all on the line and he says the thing, and you know that it was about him giving his life. Because as soon as he responds, if you see this back in verses 61 through 64, that as soon as he responds, they completely understand what he's saying. This is why they're tearing their clothes and yelling blasphemy. It's because what they realize is they realize that only God can get away with saying what Jesus just said. And since they don't think he's God, they have condemned God to death for saying that he was God. And so you have this this appearance here in the trial of everything like kind of appearing orderly and seeming like they want to follow some rules. And as soon as they get that verdict... As soon as they feel like Jesus has cast the final stone and said who he was, they go from just and orderly to humiliating and shameful. Look at this in verse 65. So he's guilty now. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and strike him, saying to him, prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. They are mocking him. Even the idea of just spitting on someone, right? Like some of you are pretty calm people here, level-headed. Like you're walking out of this room and someone shoves you, you're probably just going to keep walking. (laughs) You're going to lose a weird day at church. (laughs) But man, if they spit on you, that's different. They spit on you. You you go from being calm to not being. Because there's something about that that is is a level of disrespect that you just don't do. And that's what they're doing to him. And it's so ironic. It's so ironic because they're telling him to prophesy. And if you just think of what's been happening over the last several, several portions of Scripture, it's exactly what he's been doing the whole time. He said, he said, in the garden, this was going to happen. You're going to strike my head, and everyone's going everyone's to leave me, and that's exactly what happened. He said, it, he said it was going to happen before it did. He said, you know what? This is Peter. What Peter's going to do is, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice, and that is literally happening while they're doing this. He's, he's, he has prophesied. Not only that, if you go back a couple days, He said that the temple was going to be destroyed, a prophecy that was fulfilled in 70 AD. Like, he's been prophesying, but I think the most ironic portion of this whole thing is that Jesus prophesied that this very thing would happen. 
If you go back to Mark chapter 10, this is what Jesus said. It's fascinating. <clears throat> this, is, this is several days. This is months before, this was, before he, he is in Jerusalem, and this is what Jesus says is going to happen. He said, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will deliver him to death. That has literally just happened. And then they'll deliver him over to the Gentiles. We'll look at that in a couple weeks. And they will mock him and spit on him. Literally fulfilling everything that they said. And they're mocking him, prophesy. This is where Jesus is so much better than me because I'd be like, I already did. (laughs) But he takes it. He's resolved that this is what he came to do. So you look at this text, and the question is, okay, so what do you do with it? And it's really important with texts like this that we realize something very clearly, that in the story we are not Jesus. We're not. But we're, we're the bad guys. <laughs> and we can learn a lot from them. And so as I look at this text and I apply it to our lives, I really see two warnings and one thing, thing to ponder. The first warning you see in this text is, is do not miss what is really important. Do not miss what's really important. I'm pretty sure I use the phrase that these religious leaders, they, they missed the forest for the trees. And I don't even think that captures the irony of how wrong they were. But if you look at verse, verse 61, like look at the question that he asks him. He asks Jesus, are you Christ, the son of the blessed? Most commentators believe that that is the clearest definition of who Jesus is in Mark's gospel. And if you just think about like how much his followers struggled to understand who he was, how much they got it wrong, here you have the, really the, one of the first people to really get it right this is the person who condemned him to die. And he, he obviously misses what's really important. Like, he knew who Jesus was, but he wasn't willing to let that transform his heart. But he knew God's word so well that he's like, well, we can't kill him unless we can get the testimony of two or three witnesses. And yet, he has the Son of God in front of him. He fully understands who he is, but he won't let it do anything inside of him. And, and we do the same stuff. Maybe you're here, and you, you, you gravitate towards legalism. Not everybody does, but some of you do. And, and you're like, you know what? You've got like your, your, your religious routine that you do. You go to church, you read your Bible, you have time set out for prayer, you, you, know, you, you do the things that you do, but it's not about connecting with him. It's really just about checking a box to say that you did. But when you do that, you're doing kind of what they're doing. You're missing the forest for the trees. And it's not about checking a box. He's not up in heaven like, hey, you got all five out of five. Like, he's not doing that. It's about connecting with him. It's about him interacting and and coming in and transforming your heart. And really the more important question isn't, did I get everything done that I was supposed to get done? The question is, has he, does he have a hold of my heart? Maybe it's not legalism is your thing, but any time you make what we're doing here into more or less of a hobby, you're missing it. You're missing what's really important. This is a horrible hobby. But when you, when you come into this place and it's like, well, I, I mean, I was there. You know, it's June. I'm doing all right. And you're not letting the truth of Scripture come into your heart and transform you in a way. Like, you're missing it. You're missing what's really important. You're playing a game. And that's exactly what they were doing. And because they were playing a game, they had the Son of God in front of them, and their response was, let's kill him. So the first warning we see here is we see not to miss what's really important. The second warning that you see here is you see the warning, don't follow Jesus at a distance. Mark intentionally puts things the way that they are to communicate even a bigger story in spite of really the, the verses that we're looking at. And what he wants us to do here is that this text comes right before Peter denies him three times. It's called a Markin sandwich. 
And, and it's right before Peter denies him three times. And as and what, what, he, what the reader should do naturally, at least according to, to Mark, is that they, what they'll do is they'll compare Jesus to Peter. And, and, and where Peter, when he is confronted, he denies Jesus three times. And Jesus, when he is confronted, he's faithful to the end. When Jesus is confronted, he doubles down on who he is, which is completely different than what Peter did. But if you think about Peter, what do we see about Peter in the text? Well, in verse 54, it says that he followed him at a distance, that he warmed himself by the fire, but when things got difficult, that's when he said that he didn't even know who Jesus was. And so we can do this thing where maybe it it seems like we're close. We have things that we say, you know, at least I'm doing this when the truth is, if we were really pressed, what would be revealed is that we really are just following Jesus at a distance. I mean, even if you think about Peter, what Peter could have said, he's like, sure, I denied him three times, but where was everyone else? At least I followed him there. And we do the same type of thing. When we look at things where we're being disobedient to what God is asking us to do, and instead of responding by doing what God asks us to do, we say, well, at least I'm not doing that. Sure, I'm not doing this, but that's way worse. I mean, that's what Peter could have done. And so we see this warning here in the text that we do not follow Jesus at a distance. And then the thing to ponder, and really this is the, the part of the, the text that, frankly, I just I couldn't shake. And it's that Jesus is unwavering in his commitment. That Jesus is unwavering in his commitment. You know when you commit to do something, it's hard. Or not even hard necessarily, but you don't want to really do it. Nothing is better than a snag. Because what a snag does is it gives you an out. You know, say your family wants to see the new Little Mermaid movie. And you open up your Alamo app and you see that all showings at the Alamo are full. You're like, oh man, too bad. Looks like that's not in the cards. There are two other movie theaters in town, but... If they don't realize that, then you're not going to bring it up. Why? It's because you don't want to see the Little Mermaid movie, right? It's a snag. It's a snag that you are very thankful for. And here we are in our text. And, like, this could have been the snag to get Jesus out of it. I mean, if, the, if, it's, if Jesus doesn't say anything, they can't execute him. They probably would have found a way, but they couldn't. That if Jesus, I mean, think about it. What happens when you get pulled over by a cop? What's the first thing that you do? Man, you start justifying yourself, right? Officer, I had no idea I was going so fast. Officer, you, I mean, you, you do all those things. Why, you, you do all those things, start dropping names, like anything you can do to get out of it. Why? Because we don't want to pay. And here you have Jesus facing the hardest thing that any human being will ever experience. And he, here's a snag. The testimony doesn't agree. Not only does the testimony not agree, but now he has an opportunity to get himself out of it. And what does he do? He doubles down on his commitment to the cross. That for the first time in Mark's gospel, Jesus explicitly says who he is. When he has everything to lose. You know why? It's because of you because of me. His mission wasn't to make it. His mission was to come and die and raise so that we could put our faith in him and have the same fate that he has. And and as excruciating as this must have been, not only was he unwavering, but we know that at least at some level, what he did brought him joy. And you see that in in Hebrews chapter 12. It says this. This is Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising its shame and is seated at the right hand 
of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It brought him joy because he knew it would save you. It brought him joy because he didn't come into this world thinking about what he would receive. He came into this world thinking of what he would give. And he would give himself so that he could save you, that even in the midst of all the pain, it brought him joy. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we're thankful for the hope that is ours. We're thankful, Jesus, that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You scorned its shame, that, that, that you are sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, and someday, God, you will come back. And we'll be able to go with you because you scorned the shame of the cross. And so, God, this morning as I pray, I I just really pray that, God, that we would evaluate our hearts. That, God, if the reality of our situation is that we're not right with you, that we don't have a relationship with you that has transformed us in a way that you have made us new, then, God, I pray that in this moment that you would make it so that we cannot shake that fact and that, God, you'd give us the faith to be able to respond. Jesus, that we would put our trust in you for what you have done for us. That we'd be aware of our need and we would put our trust in you. God, help us be people who don't miss what's important. Help us, God, to be people who who give it all to you because you gave it all for us. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks so much for checking us out online. I just hope that whatever you saw, that it was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. And if you'd like to give today, there are two ways you can do so. You can text your amount to 84321, or you can go to giving.nlspringfield.com and give that way. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you. Our service times are at 8, 9.30, and 11. And if you're new, on the first Sunday of every single month, we have an event called Party with the Pastors, which is a great way for you to get to know us, and it's a great way for us to get to know you. So we look forward to seeing you there.